In revolutionary France, on September 2 to 3, 1792, the famous September murders took place. At that time, the Girondists were in power something like analogues of the Russian provisional government of Alexander Fyodorovich Kerensky, trying to sit between two chairs, revolution and counter-revolution. And on September 2, a rumor spread through Paris that the Prussians had taken Verdun, the last fortress covering the road to the capital, in fact, it happened a little later, in the evening of the same day. And then the people, not relying on the authorities, decided to take the fight against the enemies of the revolution into their own hands and organized the lynching of the arrested aristocrats. It is curious that at that moment almost all the Jacobin leaders, except Marat, condemned what had happened and turned away from the Septemberbrists, although some later recognized that these spontaneous popular actions may have saved the revolution. Marie-Therese Louise de Lamballe was a friend of Queen Marie Antoinette, which determined her tragic fate. This noble lady was born 8, 09, 1749 in the Kingdom of Sardinia, in the city of Turin. In 1770, the princess was presented to Queen Marie Antoinette and they became friends. In 1775 she was appointed Obergoffmeister to the Queen. The common people hated the Queen. In the pre-revolutionary years of Paris was literally flooded with brochures, or rather, libels against her, which spoke of the lascivious mores that reigned at court. When in Paris began really violent unrest, de Lamballe sent to England, so as not to jeopardize her life. Marie Antoinette September 1791 sent her from the prison Tillery's letter, which asked her friend to stay in England. These requests were repeated by the king in his letters do not even think of moving from the place. The royal couple was well aware that the return of the princess means for her death sentence. Nevertheless, she disobeyed the sovereigns. Leaving England, the princess arrived in Paris and was next to the captive queen. The sovereigns, along with their children, were transferred to the prison of Thample, next to the queen was still Princess Lamball. However, after another week, the Paris Commune issued a decree that all outsiders had to leave the Templo immediately. The Princess de Lamball and many other court ladies were transferred to the first prison. On August 17, 1792, an extraordinary tribunal was established to combat counter-revolution. By decision of this punitive body, arrests were made of royalists representatives of the nobility and aristocracy. On the night of September 2 began their executions, it would be more accurate to call them a continuous massacre, which lasted until September 5th. Several thousand people, practically the whole color of the French nobility, were brutally murdered during these three days. The Princess de Lamballe was seemingly forgotten on the first day of the massacre, but they came for her the next day. The execution of the princess was preceded by a short popular trial, presided over by the public prosecutor of the municipal commune, the well-known left-wing Jacobin journalist Hébert. Upon entering the hall, the princess fainted at the first moment. Hébert waited until she came to her senses and demanded, identify yourself. Maria Louise, Princess of Savoy, replied the arrested woman. Eber asked her occupation. Obergoff Misterina of the Queen, what do you know of the court conspiracy of August 10? The prosecutor asked. I know nothing about it, replied the princess. I don't even know whether such a conspiracy existed at all. It is the first time I have ever heard of it. Then it is your duty to swear that you support the ideas of liberty and equality and to declare in public that you hate the king and queen and the whole monarchical regime, said Eber. I do support the ideas of liberty and equality, replied the princess, but I will never confess to hating sovereigns, because it is untrue and against my conscience. Supporting Mrs. Lamball under his arm, the jailer quietly said to her I beg of you, swear immediately to everything, or else you will perish. But the princess remained silent. Release this noble woman. Eber announced his decision. Release meant to remove the prison guards, that is, to put into the hands of the mob for massacre. Judging from some accounts, the execution of the princess took place rather quickly. But, of course, royalists this was not enough, and the scene began to grow more and more gruesome details. Probably she was still alive, and someone Charla, deciding to finish her off, struck her with a club. The butcher Grisons cut off her head, and then began the hours-long torture of the corpse. And, as if waiting for its time, the crowd attacked the body with fury, cutting it with sabers, piercing it with pikes, until it was a bloody and shapeless stump. Two men were assigned to him, 
who were busy washing him and asking others to notice how white and delicate the body was. Contemporaries say that at this time they witnessed scenes so outrageous in their debauchery that it is impossible for them to describe them. Mercier testifies that over the corpse of Madame Lambal was committed all the most atrocious that only able to think of a mad sadist. Her breasts were cut off and her stomach was cut open, from which all the insides were taken out. One of the killers, wrapped in intestines, pulled out the heart of the unfortunate victim and began to tear it with his teeth. As a result, the body was cut into pieces, and all the parts of the bandits divided among themselves, and one of them, who got the genitals, for the sake of a joke arranged them from them like a mustache. Bertrand de Malville claimed that one leg of the princess, torn from her torso, was loaded into a cannon and fired. A member of the municipality left the following description of the cortege two types dragged by the feet the naked and decapitated corpse of the Princess de Lambal, with the abdomen torn to the chest. In front of temple the procession paused. The mutilated body was placed on a rickety platform, trying to make it look dignified. All this was done with such equanimity and deliberateness that one wondered whether these people were in their right mind. On my right one of the ringleaders waved a pike with the head of Madame de Lambal on it, and every time her long hair touched my face. On the left another, still more horrible, with a huge knife in his hand, was pressing the victim's entrails to his breast. They were followed by an enormous charcoal man, carrying shreds of blood-soaked and muddy shirt on the tip of a spade. The bandits took the head of the princess to the barber and demanded from the master that he properly trimmed Lambalsha, so that Antoinette recognized her. The unfortunate barber had no choice but to comply with their demands. He had to wash his head, curl and powder his still luxuriant blonde hair, though he was unable to remove the residue of blood from his hair. His cheeks were blushed according to the fashion of the time. At least now Antoinette will be able to recognize her, the crowd scoffed. As they approached the Templum, the crowd demanded that the royal family appear at the window. They were anxious for Marie Antoinette to get a glimpse of what was left of her beloved friend. A young officer of the municipal guard conveyed this demand to the king. When Marie Antoinette heard it, she lost her senses. And the crowd at the temple went wild, demanding the queen's head. The odyssey of the corpse continued for days. Mad murderers walked the streets and publicly showed the bloody remains of Madame de Lambal. Who would have thought that not long ago these gruesome body parts were a beautiful blonde princess?